Imagine you have a hedgehog, but at some point you notice your pet sort of started to expand? It gets bigger and bigger, although it stays very light? And this seems weird. Well, the hedgehog can't swell, right? Turns out it can. This poor animal was found in Bude, Cornwall, and they took it to the vet right away. At first, the staff couldn't understand why such a large hedgehog still remained very light. The animal could neither move nor curl up into a ball, and this caused it severe stress. Only the x-rays could shed light on what was happening. There was actual air inside the hedgehog. Or rather, not quite inside, more like around it. This incredibly rare condition is called the balloon syndrome and may be observed in hedgehogs who suffered an injury. According to one theory, the gas is released by bacteria that ended up in a serious wound. Another says the reason is damage to the trachea. But in any case, swelling is very dangerous. If you don't drain the trapped gas in time, the hedgehog can pop or just swell up so much that it suffocates, which is why vets in Cornwall took a syringe, a most common one, and drained the excess air from under the hedgehog's skin. Took about five minutes, and the animal felt better right away. Hedgehogs suffer from this weird balloon syndrome because of their ability to curl up into a ball. Their skin's too stretchy. One can say that hedgehogs, well, have too much skin? Turns out the evolutionary gift has a serious side effect, but hedgehogs aren't the only creatures who have issues. Look at the musk oxen. These are huge, shaggy animals that can weigh more than 770 pounds if we're talking about the males and charge up to 30 miles per hour. And then the male musk oxen headbutt each other. This happens during the breeding season, and they keep doing that again and again and again. A male musk ox can suffer about 2,100 blows to the head over the course of its 10 to 12 year lifespan. How can you survive this and not get injured? Well, you can't. When the scientists examined the brain of the musk ox, they found very specific and quite severe traumas. In fact, these are chronic traumas, which in old age can lead to a condition like dementia. Nature has given the poor oxen a really dangerous way to fight for females, and it's considered okay. Well, as long as no one dies of such injuries on the spot, it's fine from an evolutionary standpoint. The only thing that saves musk oxen is age. Males just don't live that long. Actually, wild animals almost never suffer from dementia. Their life is challenging enough, so aging usually manifests itself only on the physical level. Animals either don't live long enough to get dementia or die at the first sign of it. Pets are a different matter. Today, there are known cases of dementia in dogs and cats, but they're caused by the care the owners give their pets, thus prolonging their lives. Perhaps if someone cared for the musk oxen like that, they would also live long enough. But back to male animals. I think that sometimes evolution holds a grudge against them. Take wasps and bees, for example. Only females have stingers. And this is sort of the natural state of things. At the very beginning of their history, many species of these insects laid eggs inside various stuff, and they needed an organ that would help in this difficult task. So evolution gave the bees and wasps stingers. But the males didn't lay eggs, so they weren't entitled to get any stingers. As for the fact that the poor males ended up completely defenseless, well, it's their problem. The males tried to solve it. They pretend they're going to sting, curling their abdomen around, but they can't do any harm. Judging by the fact that bees and wasps are still not extinct, this silly deception works great from the evolutionary standpoint. While we're on the subject of insects, we should mention ants. It had seemed that they have existed on the planet for so long and are so widely spread they simply can't have problems with evolution. But this is only at first glance. Ordinary ants live very little, as in general most other social insects. However, the ant queens found a way to bend the rules. They can live for years or even decades, while worker ants, which have never laid a single egg in their lives, die in a few months. This is actually the best case scenario. They could end up as someone's lunch even earlier. Moreover, such a difference in lifespan can't be explained by their genes. Most likely, the reason lies in nutrition and care. The ant queen, just like the queen bee and the termite queen, always get the best care, best food, and protection. Of course, in conditions like that, you can live at least 10 years. Would ordinary ants live longer if they took care of themselves and not of their queen? I think so. But they give up longevity for the good of the colony. Quite selfless of them. 
However, don't think that queens necessarily have a life like in paradise. A termite queen, for example, produces an egg every 3 seconds for 15 years, non-stop. That's about 30,000 eggs per day. Her body distends. What starts off as being the length of a small coin extends to be about the size of a human index finger. The termite queen also spends her entire life underground without any sunlight. Being so large, she can't even move. If you think about it, is she really a queen? Or is she just a prisoner doomed to a long life? This is how nature works. It gives the animal some kind of perk, then it always takes something away or creates a bunch of problems. Sharks actually drown in fresh water. I'm not even kidding. Only 5% of Elasma Bronx, that is sharks and rays, can survive in fresh water. Fresh water dehydrates them, dulls their senses, and compromises their ability to reproduce. Ooh. Sharks must store salt inside their bodies. Without it, Ooh. their cells will collapse, resulting in death. Ooh. But the strangest thing about that is that fresh water makes sharks drown. Due to the loss of buoyancy, the shark has to spend about 50% more energy on lift, which is really a lot. Of course, they can also grow a huge liver like other freshwater species, but then the body would become less agile and the shark would no longer be such a good hunter. In short, it makes more sense for it to just stay in salt water and not change its habitat. That's actually a good thing for humans. When you don't have to fear encountering a shark in the river, you somehow feel safer. The thing is, there's also a bull shark which doesn't care about the salinity of the water. If this shark wants to swim out of the sea and go up the river, it's going to do it. The bull shark's also a damn aggressive creature that probably most often attacks people. No, seriously. We're lucky the rest of the sharks stay away from rivers. Though sharks are lucky compared to, say, antechinuses, these little predators practice mating to death. <laughs> and yes, it happens exactly as you thought. Antechinuses have a very frantic mating season. Breeding bouts can last from 12 to 14 hours. Each male will try to mate with as many females as he can. As a result, his body simply can't take it and disintegrates. A couple of weeks after mating, males die after living on average for only 11 months, while females live two to three years. Listen, seems like males are unlucky again. From the evolutionary standpoint, this is also fine. Was mating a success? Good. Geckos land headfirst into a tree? Well, can they reproduce? It's fine then. Imagine slamming your head into a wall at a Lamborghini's top speed. This is what geckos feel like when they move through the trees. This is not their intention to smash against something hard. It's actually a way to cushion the landing. To Steve, that gecko's behavior looks like rolling that parkour guys and other movie characters do when they land. This is needed to dampen the impact and avoid injury. Do geckos know about the existence of parkour? I doubt that. But they have to smash their heads into trees because evolution has decided this is a cool way to land. It's sort of a defense mechanism. And not the worst version of it. The hairy frog is the creature that evolution treated unfairly. It has no claws because it's a frog. But if it ever needs them, the poor amphibian breaks its own bones so they can come out of the frog's toes. This is its weapon in case of danger. Compared to the hairy frog, Wolverine is actually lucky. Even though they look a bit alike. I mean the sideburns. I don't know what growing claws feels like and how painful it is, but I don't think the frog appreciates it. Just like how vultures don't appreciate wind turbines. It'd seem that vultures have the sharpest eyesight among animals, but they are the ones who most often crash into wind turbines and power lines. Vultures can see their prey far below, but they can't spot wind turbines. I mean, they literally can't see them. Turns out these birds have large blind spots above and below their heads, and since they hold their heads at a downward angle when they fly, they're blind to everything that's directly in front of them even an obstacle this big. So people have already found a solution to this issue, and quite a surprising one. Not because of the vultures. Other birds also crash into wind turbines quite often, and something had to be done about it. As an experiment, they painted one blade of a wind turbine black, and bird fatalities dropped by 72%. For some reason, it worked especially well for white-tailed eagles. 
So far, this is of course just a small experiment, we need to collect more data to understand whether black blades are really that effective. But here's a fact for you. As an alternative solution, there are systems that can monitor wind farms using cameras or radar. When they detect a bird approaching, they slow down or completely stop the turbines. But if you slow down the turbines every time a bird is inbound, it'll cost a damn lot. Though how we shall help birds that can't see in the fog is not yet very clear. Yes, over so many years, evolution still hasn't fixed this bug. It happens in a terrifyingly simple way. Birds fly away from sunny areas. On the way, they fly into the fog over the sea and become completely disoriented. They fly until they're exhausted and fall into the water. They die by the hundreds. Moreover, without fog, most birds would never fly over the ocean. They usually stay above the ground and constantly look down. Strangely enough, evolution hasn't come up with a solution to that. Though after all the animal problems I've mentioned today, what else can you expect from it? See you later.